Welcome to episode nine of Plant Prescription, the official houseplant podcast from Costa Farms. Uh, I'm Justin Hancock, uh, horticulturist here, and I'm joined by the lovely Michelle, uh, IPM manager. Um, we're here to talk about plant issues, plant questions, um, and your plant experiences. So how are you doing, Michelle? I am doing well. It's a lovely balmy 70 degrees here in North Carolina today. Much improvement from our, I think it was 27 degrees last night. So, Wow, that's quite a swing for one day. Doing pretty good. I mean, it is a swing state. Uh, 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 anyway, <laughs> how are you, Justin? I am well, thank you. Happily, our houseplants don't notice those big temperature swings as much as our, our outdoor plants. Uh, oh. A lot of the tropicals would be screaming. Yeah, it's a really sad, slow death for some of the Gerberas out there. They're the last ones that are just like clinging on for dear life. <laughs> just wondering when they're finally going to just let it go. But Time to replace them with pansies and kale. You know, if I had the time, I would love to do that. And that was my plan. However, being realistic about it, it's probably not going to happen. It is beautiful, though. I love it when people do that. It just... I know myself. I don't have, I don't think I'll do it this year. I I know the feeling. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, <laughs> enough about dead plants and dying plants. Let's talk about maybe some customers, <laughs> dead plants and dying plants. Oh boy. Let's talk about how oh. we can help people from, from getting their plants uh, to be in a dead or dying state. Shall we? Yes. Let's prevent that from happening. All right. Question number one today comes from Brittany in Syracuse, New York. I bought a Moonlight Scandapsis at the local plant store. Uh, I ran it out to the car. Uh, it wasn't in the cold very long, but it was a little bit cold. Now the leaves are turning yellow. How can I save it? Okay, Brittany, uh, define a little bit cold because I lived, actually, I, I'm really excited to get a question from Syracuse. That's where I grew up. Well, around there and Syracuse is cold. We're talking like negative 20 degrees at times, frozen eyebrows, coughing when you walk outside, it's cold, cold. So I do wonder what's a little bit cold because a little bit cold, cold for a Syracuse person is like, I don't know, zero degrees versus a little bit cold for somebody in Florida, maybe mm, 60 degrees. So I, I do wonder how cold was it? Um, that being said, uh, Justin, what do you think is going on here? Well, you know, happily, it sounds like Brittany has identified the, the issue for us this time and that it's cold uh, damage. Um, the unfortunate thing is that there's not really a lot you can do. It's, it's really, you know, being patient and seeing if the plant can recover by itself. Um, or if it was exposed to enough cold that unfortunately it's just not going to bounce back. Um, Scandapsis in particular is a little bit tender to, to cooler temperatures than some of the other houseplants. So it's more easily damaged. Um, even just to trip out from the, the store to the car if it's not wrapped in a paper bag and it's, it's well below freezing can, can damage it. I did not know that. You know, because I... Growing up in Syracuse, my dad loved house plants. My dad loved tropical plants, and he, he would do the same thing. He would run a plant from the from the car to the house, or vice versa, like run. Also, forgot to ask, how cold is it? How fast of a runner are you? Because <laughs> because it is even a even a little dip in some cold weather would just like whammo some plants. It would never kill them. But it would definitely stress them out. Whereas some tropicals, I mean, you could go at a leisurely walk, give or take, from the house to the car. It's it's really weird how some are more sensitive than others. And I'm shocked that Scandapsis is one of those because for me, I thought that Scandapsis would be a more durable plant because it's got those like thicker, uh, kind of like rougher leaves. Well, depending on the species, I guess. But this is, what species is this? Uh, this moonlight? is Moonlight, yeah. Okay. Again, I mean, I am, I am surprised. I, I could, it very well could be cold damage though. You know, something else to think about too, is that um, if the car is cold, just because you're in the car, it, it doesn't mean the, the, the plant is magically more protected. 
Um, you know, and if it takes a couple of minutes for the, the, the inside of the car to warm up after you start it, you know, that's that much more time that the plant was exposed to potentially sub-freezing temperatures, um, which, you know, does the damage. The, the other thing, too, to think about is that um, cold is damaging to a plant. It's a form of stress. Uh, when you first take a plant home, it's also going to, to go over some um, relocation stress. And the more different kinds of stressors that you pile on top, the harder it is, unfortunately, for the plant to be able to come back. Um, if it was overwater or underwatered in the store, that could also play a role in in its recovery. Um, yeah. You know, so it's yeah, there 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 could be a lot of other factors other than just the cold, but but certainly the cold sounds like um, a main factor. But it's yellowing leaves, so to me. It, it, I mean, it really depends because my experience from what I've seen with plants that get frozen is it just immediate meltdown um, afterwards. That's what I've seen a lot of times. It kind of sounds like this is more of a stressor than a complete death sentence. I'm just being optimistic here. <laughs> yeah, you know, and 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 that's the and that's the thing with with cold. Um, you know, like Michelle is saying, it's not a black and white thing. You know, there's, 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 sure, it's been so cold that it's going to die, but then there's that spectrum to there's cold enough that it was injured. Mm -hmm. Just like my Gerberas. Everybody else is dead. If the Gerberas in a different location are dead and those are still somehow alive. But with the yellowing leaves, yeah, cold damage is hard because it, it happens not immediately. I mean, that's what's also scary sometimes about getting plants in the mail is you got to watch it because they may arrive looking beautifully uh, and then they can go downhill pretty quickly. So, yeah, uh, you know, a fun fact, when we do shipping tests um, for Costa Farms, um, the the team typically waits about 10 days before they start looking at how the plants look after the shipping test. You know, it's not like you you take them out of the box and say, oh, it shipped well. Uh, yeah. No, no. It's, it's, it's that long term. OK. You know, is is the plant stressed and, and damaged, um, you know? So that they do 10 days because from what I've seen, just from what I'm my experience, um, cold damage tends to appear about 24 hours after, you know, it, it experiences said event. And then it can range anywhere from just complete death and destruction that day to a couple of days you know, prolonged yellowing leaves and things. Is that is that why 10 days, just to be absolutely sure that any damage was seen? Well, and yeah, um, shipping damage can be any number of things. It could be the box got too hot, the box got too cold, the plant didn't like being in the dark, you know, the Wah. it was too humid in the box, <laughs> you know, which is why we test, you know, which is exactly why we test different species. Oh. Um, but... But yeah, the, um, the the best thing you can do, Brittany, is give it good, consistent care and see if it's able to bounce back on its own. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe next time, uh, put it in a bag um, just to kind of buffer it from that cold weather. Just a little buffer, anything um, from those leaves, a bag, a box. Yeah. Whenever I buy a plant, and it's a tropical plant and it's less than 40 degrees. I always make the 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 store wrap it in a plastic bag, and I've had to argue with store people a couple of times. Really? Uh huh. Because they didn't want to give me a bag, and it's what? like, nope. I am the customer. I know what I want. Wow. And if you don't bag this, there's a really good chance it's going to come back as a return. So. Huh. Huh. Well, good on you, Justin. You take care uh, of those plants. I also grew up in northern Minnesota where, you know, like <laughs> frozen like, eyebrow like, state. Exactly. Like Syracuse, <laughs> you know, minus 40 is a real thing. Yeah. So cold to some people like New Yorkers, Minnesotians, Minnesotians, Min Minnesotians, Minnesotans. Minnesotans. Cold to us is very different than cold to uh, Florida. Anyway, so good luck with that, Brittany. Ugh. It's one of the one of those things about living in a cold state. You got to be a good runner or <laughs> be like Justin and be good at negotiating a bag for your plans. 
All right. Question number two comes from Arkansas. Uh, Stephanie in Little Rock says, I think my polka dot begonia has powdery mildew. What's the best way to stop it? Polka dot begonia, the maculata? The maculata, yeah. Okay. Question number one. I, pretty sure it has powdery mildew, but sure, sure it has powdery mildew because a lot of, so the team at, Costa Carolina, um, everybody, and you know, a lot of people, when we see white spots on plants, there's this immediate reaction that, ah, it's powdery mildew. Whereas sometimes it's just water residue or calcium deposits from again, water, whatever, what have you. Um, and so are you absolutely sure it's powdery mildew? I'm not questioning you, but just make sure we check these boxes off. When you look at it, um, does it, Obviously, does it look like a water droplet or not? Powdery mildew, it forms on the tops of leaves. It tends to be white, sometimes a grayish color, but most of the time white. Um, and if you look really closely at that splotch, um, it, it kind of looks fuzzy. And that's the fungal growth that's right there because powdery mildew is a fungus to mildew. Um, so if you look closely, does it look like like little fuzzy things in there or not. And when in doubt, just if, if you're like, huh, I don't know, don't, don't try to scrape it off because you could spread it somewhere else. But the best thing you could do is to get like a damp paper towel with the couple of leaves that have these spots on them, put it in a Ziploc container with a wet paper towel, a damp paper towel, and like close it and check it every two-ish days, depending. And if that white spot grows, well, it's, it's active, it's alive, it's most likely powdery mildew. If it doesn't, it's probably like a water spot. Um, so first off, just because this is a common um, misidentified thing, is powdery mildew is very commonly misidentified. So, but it sounds like you're pretty confident that it is powdery mildew, which does happen on begonias. I never seen it on maculata, but I've seen it on other begonias. I don't imagine why it wouldn't happen on maculata. Justin, have you seen it on a maculata yet? I have, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, begonia maculata. I wouldn't say prone, but it can it can certainly get it um, if it's kept a little cooler than it likes and a little darker than it likes. Okay. And on that and note, yeah, go ahead. So the so so if it is powdery mildew, the easiest way to to combat it would be to change the the cultural conditions and move it to a warmer brighter place um where the where the fungus isn't um as well adapted to growing and the plant can fight it off better yeah from powdery mildew what i've seen most of the time is the plant is already stressed so there's this like pathogen triangle thing that you you know where i'm going with this there's like a an infection triangle basically there's what we call a, like a triangle of death thing. And well, it's not a triangle of death, but I'm calling it the triangle of death. Basically three things need to happen, like three points on a triangle or pyramid in order for a fungus or a pathogen bacteria, whatever you have to infect a plant. Um, obviously number one, the fungal thing needs to be fungus or bacteria needs to be present, which clearly it's present. Um, oftentimes one of the other points is the conditions need to be favorable for the fungus or pathogen to grow. Because as Justin mentioned, if it's in a sunny area, warmer, um, brighter, uh, that is not ideal for this organism, which is alive to grow. It doesn't like it sunny. It doesn't like it warm. Well, we'll get back to that. Hold on. We uh, we'll get back to that. This one's really tricky for me. Um, we'll get back to that because every there's always exceptions. Um, and then again, your third point being there's probably some sort of stress on the plant to make it vulnerable to said infection. So there's a pathogen present. There is the environment is perfect for said pathogen. So it's love and life. And then number three, the plant is at risk or it, it's like vulnerable because it went through some sort of stressor, be that food, um, it's hungry. Maybe it went through, uh, some severe watering <laughs> changes. We've all done it. Uh, you water a plant in heavy and then it goes bone dry and it doesn't like it. Or maybe the temperature is too cold for the plant, but it's perfect for the fungus. You know, there's a lot of, or light, there's a lot of things that can stress a plant out and make it prone and susceptible to said pathogen that is present. Now, that being said, 
powdery mildew specifically tends to be kind of host specific. <laughs> host specific. <laughs> host specific. Uh, so, like, not all powdery behaves the same way. Some powdery may like it dry and hot, surprisingly enough. Some may like it cool and damp. It really honestly depends on the species. With begonias, you're better off keeping them dry, keeping those leaves dry, um, because that that powdery would probably like it more wet, wetter. Uh, <laughs> okay, last thing. Okay, so powdery mildew, Justin recommends um, – changing the environment, which would get rid of the, there's an X, X mark. It would get rid of that one corner of that triangle. The uh, environment is favorable for that pathogen, possibly also get rid of the other triangle, uh, the other corner of the death pyramid, the death triangle. I don't, I forgot what I called it already, but the other corner. So we got two corners gone because all of a sudden now the conditions are favorable for the plant and they're unfavorable for the pathogen. But don't forget the third one is that it's present. It is there. So while you're at it, cleaning house, like uh, karate chopping the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> if you guys could, please, if you watch this on YouTube, you're going to get uh, uh, karate chopping the, um, death pyramid, you may as well try to get rid of that last point, which is removing the presence of this thing. And you can do that manually. You could take the infected leaves off. If you do, please, 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 because you're going to make it worse. If you don't, make sure it's clean. Make sure you wash your hands. You wash whatever scissors or whatever. You try to disinfect it if possible. Um, you try to disinfect your gloved hands, ideally, um, or your scissors or whatever you have to chop said leaves. So you take you remove those don't forget to remove any infected leaves that have fallen down because those are still even though the leaves are dead there's still a living pathogen living fungus on them most likely so get rid of all of that if you can clean up and um, sanitize the surrounding area and if you really want to go the extra mile you could apply a fungicide and try to kill any spores that have landed that haven't really um sporulated yet on the plant so Chop, chop, chop. The three sides of the triangle. Once you're sure it's powdery mildew, of course. Uh, because as referring back to episode um, one or two, it is very important to identify your exact issue before you start treating it. Because you could just waste your money and time and make it worse. Whew. Okay. And rant. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. I've been watching your face like the whole time. You're like, is she going to stop? I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Stephanie, you. we hope that that helps. Um, uh, I hope you can make it through that. You know, and and you know something that I think is is really um, helpful that Michelle touched on um, is that is that there are so many strains of powdery mildew um, that that the different strains only affect different plants. So you yep. don't necessarily need to be worried that your begonia's powdery mildew is going to attack your alocasia. Um, or your pothos or your dracaena. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people talking about that and, and having that concern. Um, and if there's a nice thing about fungi, about fungal infections, about it's, powdery it's, mildew. Well, a, a lot of fungi, actually. You know? <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna have a debate offline about that one. Okay, because not a lot. There's a lot of fungi out there that can infect a lot of hosts, like a very broad host range. Powdery mildew, downy mildew are some of the more specific ones. So good, good on them. The Sorry. IPM manager has schooled me. So I think that's a great <laughs> opportunity to move on to question number three. Uh, this one comes from Amber in Provo, Utah. Um, I'm going to be gone. Uh, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks. How can I ensure my houseplants stay alive uh, while I'm out? A couple of weeks. Woo. I, uh, how many, I have some questions. So I would wonder how many house plants does this person have? How attached are they? How much time and effort are they willing to put into this? Because I mean, you could go all the way to an automatic drip irrigation system connected to your, uh, sink if you wanted to. Uh, but that is a lot of money and it's also risky, very risky, uh, to have drip irrigation 
inside of your house while you are away. Um, so that being said, there's a lot of easier ways. Justin, you take it away first. I would not recommend your irrigation um, unless you really love your plants and like to, like to live life on the edge. Justin? Uh, my my tried and true, which is which has always worked for me um, when I don't have an excess number of plants, um, is to take them, uh, put them in the bathtub, uh, give them all a really good watering, uh, let let the water drain out, um, and then close up the close up the drain so that there's a little water pooling in the tub, but away from the bottoms of the pots. Um, and then, and then just leave them there for, for the time that I'm away. Um, being all grouped together, they're going to increase humidity. Um, if I close off my bathroom, the humidity overall in the bathroom will also be higher. Um, and that's usually enough to keep them going. Plus, um, I have not lived in too many houses where there's there's been a lot of direct sun in the bathroom, so it yeah. typically stays a little bit cooler and not as bright, yep. um, both of which will slow the plant's growth rates. The slower the plants grow, the less water they need. So, Yeah. Yeah, I think that taking it away from direct sunlight would be number one. Um, plants can go with lower light for shorter periods of time. I, a couple of weeks should be okay um, in lower light. There is, you know, originally I thought of possibly putting them in like little saucers, the little plastic saucers and watering them and leaving a little reservoir. But at the same time, I don't think that would be ideal for a couple of weeks because you could end up with root rot if you let them sit in the water like that in a darker area. Um, I have never done it. Justin, you and I have talked about it, though, in um, what is it, severe do or die situations where traveling for a while with all of the plants. The reason I haven't done it is because it takes a long time, but you could develop your own little wick system. Um, or you could just buy water wick plants. I'm sorry. I meant wick and grow plants. Um, and basically all that is, is a, uh, it's like a it's string. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> it's especially uh, designed to wick. There we go. It's so much better worded than just string. Uh, it's that um, basically connected to a reservoir of water. And then the other end goes into your plant. Um, and it will just kind of via capillary action, which is basically like when water, when the plant, it's going to get complicated when the plant, breathes so to say when the plant is growing when it's respiring or yeah respiring right justin thank you transpiring oh lord oh god i feel like you should take it away just watch me fumble my way through this and please just correct everything i've messed up when i'm done so when the plant is transpiring evapotranspiration um the the plant basically uh, a water molecule will leave the plant and it'll leave an absence of a water molecule. It'll basically like there is suddenly no water molecule where it once was. And so the plant will suck up another water molecule to put in its place um, and it'll keep doing this. It's basically like this big um, like uh, bleh, line. It's like this big assembly line that's constantly putting a H2O molecule where it needs to go and it's pulling it from one area with a high level of water, like high concentration of water to the other area where it's missing water. It's, hence capillary action. It's been a long time. Is that about right, Justin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, this is, this is really embarrassing. So anyway, basically it pulls water from the reservoir into the plant which is constantly pulling water and oh, well, like sweating it into the environment. Okay. I'm done. Justin, take it away. I can't do it anymore. You know, if you, um, if, if there's anybody you kind of trust or trust a lot to come in and water your plants for you too, you know, that's, that's always a solution. Um, you know, if there are other plant lovers in your area, uh, doing like a, I'll gift you a cutting of of a plant that that you really like or or something like that can be a great incentive for them to to help you out while you're gone. And you could use a lot of sticky notes, sticky notes everywhere. 
<laughs> oh, and it goes without saying, but if you're growing your plants under grow lights, make sure to adjust those down. Um, maybe give it only a couple hours of the grow light or like one or two hours just to kind of keep it like kicking. Um, but cut it way back. If you're using grow lights, cut that time way back. It goes without, goes without saying. Just like cool. Something. Yeah. Cool. And cool and not bright is, is key there. Yeah. Yep. Well, happy travels. Wherever you may go, be be going. All right, moving on to our misconception of the of the day. Um, so I have I have seen a um, a meme a number of times on Instagram now that says there are two kinds of plant people, <laughs> and you know there's one like there's just this completely brown and dead pothos, and they're like I'm gonna save this. <laughs> and then there's the pothos that has the one leaf that has like a little bit of yellow edge. Uh -huh. And they're like, my plant is dying. What do I do? Oh, um, wait, hold on. Before we go any further, can I guess which one you are? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm I'm realistic and I'm square in the middle. No. Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you don't you don't do too many um, rehab cases, I guess. Well, and I feel like I have a good gauge of when it can be rehabbed. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but, never mind. but yeah, the misconception. Justin's a moderate. Justin's in the middle. He's, what is it? He's good. <laughs> <laughs> He's, I don't know. Uh, keep going. Sorry. Um, a, a yellow leaf, especially if it's at the base of the plant, it could just simply be that that leaf is aging out. Um, a lot of new plant parents don't realize that each individual leaf has a lifespan, um, and it's perfectly natural for this leaf to, to reach the end of its individual leafy life. Once yeah. it does, it, it drops off. Um, you know, there are, there are all kinds of different types of, of stress that um, can be short-term stressors, like after you repot a plant, you might see some yellowing. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's dying at all. If you let it dry down a couple of days later, you may see a couple of yellow leaves, but it's fine. Um, on the topic of uh, basically like a time span, a ticking time bomb for each leaf on a plant, I've noticed that some leaves in some plants, their leaves tend to be much shorter lived than others. Um, I have in mind typically like for this, a monstera leaf, a monstera deliciosa, those leaves can last a very long time, a uh, very, very long time versus something like an alocasia, which was really annoying to my sister. Um, she was trying, her goal was to get like four leaves on this alocasia and she could never get four leaves green on her alocasia. And it's like every time a new leaf was coming up, another one immediately just started yellowing out. And it's kind of funny because, you know, I don't really know the answer, but I think from what I've seen, things like alocasias, they go through leaves a lot and they only have a certain number of leaves on the plant at any one time versus something like a monstera. They just keep adding leaves and some of the older leaves at the base, my goodness, they're old. Like they will, they will stay green for a very long time. So just a little fun thing that you made me think of when you said that. It's very true that certain plants' leaves are ticking time bombs and some only live for short periods of time. A couple of factors that influence plant life leaf span. Nope, said it wrong. Plant leaf <laughs> lifespan. It's okay. I, <laughs> uh, are the thickness of the leaf in general, the thicker the leaf, the longer it tends to last. Um, and then the growth rate of the plant, uh, the faster the plant tends to grow, the faster the older leaves tend to die out as well. Yeah, I could see that. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, any plant updates, Michelle? I do. I have a big one. I've got a big plant update, like plants update, multiple plants. I, Justin Hancock, have finished my grow room. That is exciting, oh, exciting stuff. I was expecting stuff. like applause or like fireworks or something. And so, <laughs> it's, <not laughs> it's okay. It's all right. I'm so, I'm like screaming on the inside about this. So um, background, 
moved into this house almost one year ago. I'm almost celebrating my one year anniversary. And, um, when I moved, it was December and just like our friend in Syracuse had to move all of my tropical plants in the middle of winter. So I boxed them up to try to like buffer them, put them in the car. Some of the bigger giant plants I could not fit into my car. And so I had to put those on a box truck in the middle of winter. It was like the high that day was like 42 maybe. And so I put them in there, timed it for the afternoon, the hottest quote unquote part of the day. And Shipped them all over. My neighbors saw me unloading plants with like a dolly, just like 10, 20 giant plants. That was my first impression in the neighborhood. Um, but that being said, after moving all the plants, moving everything else in, having an oil furnace that was really dry heat, really kind of fluctuating temperatures in the house over the winter, my plants have gone, they've been through it for about a year now. They have, they loved summer. But now that winter is here, I really needed to tuck them all in. And so I converted one of the guest bedrooms, priorities, um, into a plant room. I have my lights. I have like my big grow lights. I made a moss wall. So I've got like, uh, took a lot of moss. I would not recommend it. Um, but I had basically like put some uh, garden uh, fencing around a pole and created like a little uh Cravice or a little um, crevice, a little cavity in the middle, stuffed it full of moss. It's like eight feet tall. It's a moss wall. Everything is going to start climbing up it. Built a shelf. Well, when I say I built a shelf, I didn't. I just supervised the building of a shelf. But the shelf was built and it like was painted. It's all in my hair. It's waterproofed. It's like got lights everywhere. So, and I've been monitoring the temperature and humidity. It's fantastic. And I'm so excited. Congratulations. Because- because it's been hard. It's been really hard on all the plants. So, <sighs> hooray. Can you hear them? Can you hear them giving the little cheers and, and shouts for you now that they're in their, their happy plant room? I can. It's it's my happy place also. Uh, I can see a lot of new growth on all of the plants pretty much. And it's really exciting. I will just, my new habit uh, is just to go in there every night after I get home. I have a ladder. I'm still working on some stuff. I just sit on the ladder. Just just sit there. <laughs> nice. 30 minutes of my night, which uh, could definitely be spent doing other things, but it's okay. Anyway, that's my plan update. Maybe I'll take a photo and we can attach it somewhere, but it's uh, I got to clean it up a little bit first. Love it. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, if you ever need a plant, if you don't ever, ever need to rehab a plant, I've got a rehabilitation center now. Because I guess I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I take the dead plant um, that is almost beyond hope. And I'm like, no, you're going to make it. So if you find yourself in that situation, Justin, send them my way. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Do you have any plant updates? Uh, No, I can't think of any good updates uh, this week. Okay. But yours is big enough for the both of us. So it's a lot of plants. Yeah, it's a big update. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to Plant Prescription. Uh, We hope you and your plants are doing well. As always, reach out um, to us with any questions you'd love to see featured on a future uh, episode. Happy gardening. (laughs) Bye-bye.